It says we're live. Let's wait here. It's like a 20 second delay. It says we're live. All right. Hey, guys, welcome for round two. Glory to the Triune God, glory to the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Our brother William needs no introduction. God has blessed him. He is a theological and muscular beast. Glory to Jesus Christ. Just to let you know, he's been gracious enough to do this late because he already had an intense session previously, which I didn't know. He debated John Loftus, guys. Now, real quickly, because he's got as much time as he wants to talk about a vitally important subject. It's about the blessed mother of our Lord Jesus Christ and by grace through faith in Jesus, our mother, <clears throat> who's glorified in the presence of her son, the Lord Jesus. But before I do that, let me explain to you why you need to go watch the debate. He had a debate. He just finished it less than an hour ago. John Loftus on the resurrection, the historical evidence of the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ on reason and theology. You must watch that debate because let me give you a little background about who John Loftus is. John Loftus was at one time a professing evangelical Christian and a student. He went to seminary, and he was a student of William Lane Craig. He ended up becoming a diehard atheist and a very rabid opponent of Christianity, uh, the Holy Bible, and the Lord Jesus Christ. But part of his journey in apostat apostatizing, and this is public record, so I'm not slandering him, he, he committed adultery. He was married and he committed adultery. If, again, brother, correct me if I'm wrong from what I remember, because this is public on the public record. Yep. No, you're correct, brother, and everything you said is correct. And he is one of the top anti-Christian apologists. He's not just an atheist. He hates everything about the faith, brother. That's right. And glory to Jesus Christ from what I've been gathering. The Lord Jesus gave our brother a mighty victory, decimated his objections, annihilated his blasphemies, to the point that John Lapta says he won't debate William again. So glory to Jesus for this gift, William. Pray for him. Pray for his family. Pray for the support. I don't need to introduce him any further. What I'm going to do is, guys, I'm going to begin in prayer. He's going to take as much time as he needs to refute the slander, the lies, the misinformation of James White using outdated, pathetic arguments. Then we'll open up to Q&A. So make sure you write your questions now. I'm going to recede in the background. He's going to take... All the time he needs. He doesn't need to rush because this is an important subject. We don't rush through this. So let's just begin in prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Father, we love you. Son of God, Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. We depend on you. Forgive us for not loving you the way we should. Forgive us for failing. Crucify our flesh. Mortify our flesh. Destroy the fruits of our flesh. Fill us with fruit from the Spirit, with power and self-control and self-discipline from the Holy Spirit to worship, love, and adore, and praise, and obey our God, and obey his word perfectly. And Father, in Jesus' name, I ask that you bless William, my brother, your child, purchased by the blood of your son, born of your spirit. Guide him to speak clearly as he refutes the lies, the slander, the misinformation of folks like James White. Father, we ask that those who spread misinformation either grant the grace to repent or give them what they deserve, but silence their lies against the truth, of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in this context, the blessed mother that you chose and created to be the human mother of your son, the Lord Jesus. But we thank you, Father, we love you. Son of God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Be with us in this session, bless this session, save us from error and ignite our hearts with the flame of passion love for the truth, a work that only you can do perfectly in us. So we yield to you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. Brother, take it away. Amen, brother. Thank you very much, brother. Um, all glory to our triune God. Everybody uh, tuning in, let me move the camera a little bit. There we go. Everybody tuning in that was watching the debate that I had with John Loftus, thank you very much for tuning in. Now we begin talking about a vitally important topic, our blessed, our immaculate mother. Why is that an important topic? James White is back at it again, doing videos, attacking Mary, doing videos, attacking the doctrines of the faith that are ancient. So what do I mean by doctrines of the faith that are ancient? For people that are tuning in, if you think that, well, you know, William is here to defend things that are uniquely Catholic, I want to be very clear for you all that are tuning in. What I am defending tonight is not only Catholic. 
it is ancient and apostolic, whether you are part of the Assyrian Church of the East, whether you identify as Syriac Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Russian, uh, Roman Catholic, Greek Catholic, whatever ancient faith you identify as, talking about the uh, talking about the bodily assumption and the dormition, the dormition, the assumption of Mary has been believed in all of those ancient faiths from the very beginning. When talking about the perpetual virginity of Mary, that has been believed as well in all of those faiths from the very beginning. So it's not a uniquely and only Catholic doctrine. It is ancient and it is apostolic. And again, you may be saying, well, William, you've talked about it before. I have talked about it before. But the new arguments that James White comes up with, and yet James White has already told me personally he won't debate me, despite the fact that in the past five years, nobody has debated the Marian dogmas more than me. Nobody has written about Mary more than me in the past five years. He still won't debate me because he thinks that I am too mean at the end of the day. Whereas I have debated many people that he knows that have no issue at all debating me. But yet we frequently hear, and I've got to be quite honest with you all tuning in, the arguments James White continues to bring up are not only old and outdated, these arguments are, they're from the 1990s. So when James White does his dividing line show, they're bad arguments as well. When he does his dividing line show, which he recently did, he'll attack other individuals. He told me not long ago in an email that he regretted bringing up my name in a video he recently did. And I let him know, anytime my name is on the tip of your tongue, I am going to do a refutation to you. I told him, debate me on the Marian dogmas. He won't do it. You know what James White is thumping his chest about? Well, you know what? I debated Jerry Matatux about 30 years ago. Jerry Matatux, who showed up to the debate without any information, said, you know what? I forgot to pair. I didn't bring any of my notes with me. And then debating another individual, not even on, not even somebody that specialized in the Marian dogmas, which is perfectly fine if that's what you want to do to continue feasting upon individuals that don't study the issues, that don't know the issues. You can continue getting away with murder. But we live in a new era, James, where people have bigger followings. It must be a nightmare knowing that well, I'm going to have more than five or 10 or 20 or, or 300 people watching my videos, and I'm going to provide a refutation each and every time James White comes out and says, well, the bodily assumption of Mary, you know, in the 1950s, it gets defined, you know, before that, you know, who believed in it? You know, before that, who believed in the Dormition? You know, before that, you know, when was this ever believed in? You know, it kind of was the Pope comes around takes a vote, and he declares this to be a dogma. Go look at the latest video that James White has done on this topic, where he does make that claim. He goes after and he attacks Mark Mirabali. He knows Mark Mirabali will never debate him. Or if he knows uh, if he knows that Mark Mirabali will not debate him on any of the topics that he wants to debate, because he doesn't, he doesn't specialize in those topics. So James White will look for him as an easy target to attack because he knows we won't debate him. But to claim that it was merely because the Pope defined it as a dogma that we now believe it is a massive insult to all of the ancient Christian faiths that don't look to the Bishop of Rome as the head of their church, yet they have celebrated the Dormition of Mary and the bodily assumption of Mary from the very beginning of the existence of their uh, church festivals that are recorded in history. So how on earth can you come to the conclusion that merely because the Bishop of Rome comes about and declares something, and then the claim that, well, you know what, he's declaring, all he's doing is um, he's declaring something that had been condemned by previous popes. Pope Gelasius condemned, condemned the... The, the transitist literature where this originates from is, again, ludicrous. You don't have any church father, which we're going to look at them in a bit. We're going to go deep into the fathers. We're going to, the idea that it took a pope 
to create that doctrine, what we're going to give James White is something he's never heard of. And I've never heard of anybody bring it up before. But we're going to hear tonight about an early church council. And I know it is lo a local council, not an ecumenical one. But don't forget the importance of local ones. An early church council that talked about the bodily assumption, the dormition and the bodily assumption of Mary, that James White has no clue, no clue about at all. Now, why is that? Because James White doesn't know a thing about dormition or bodily assumption literature. Instead, he uses old and outdated arguments, old and outdated arguments that attack Mary that have been refuted. I mean, really, I got to be quite honest with you. When I debate and I dialogue with his very own Turretin fan, I don't hear this kind of garbage brought up anymore. Turretin fan has recognized, well, you know what? I have, um, I've got to utilize better, better argumentation. And I appreciate that, greatly appreciate it. He's a worthy opponent and a good friend. I have nothing negative to say about Turretin Van. Nothing. He's a good guy. So, but we have to be very honest with the information. Very honest. And to be told, well, you know what? Uh, you, you know, comes really, really late. I'm going to read to you three individuals. And why am I particularly picking three? Because one of the three of these individuals, James White, made a video on Epiphanius, or Epiphanius, however you want to pronounce it. I like saying Epiphanius. So. Epiphanius, Epiphanius, whichever way. But to claim that we rely, that we only rely on transitive literature that was condemned is completely ludicrous. You do not find any of the early fathers, and by the way, we will also look at a document that I have, I've done a video, a very, very short video about it, um, dubbed it the Vienna document, which scholars today, not only one, multiple ones are dating it to the 100s that talks about the bodily assumption of Mary. Now, are there other scholars that date it later? No, there are others that are telling you we recognize that the document, the manuscript, it was written on, I believe they say it's from the 800s, but scholars have dated the actual text to the 100s. I've talked to a number of them. I've read the theological journals that they've released in German. I have provided a translation of that German into English. Go check that out. But that aside, without even using that as, as, as testimony, because James White... Um, has no clue about that. Now, why, why, what is the point of me telling you he has no clue? He doesn't do his homework. But Epiphanius, in his Panarian 79, says about Mary. Now, we're going to talk about the bodily assumption of Mary. We've done it before. The goal today is not to give you a lesson biblically or historically. Well, you know, we can do that in the process. The goal is to refute the lies, the misrepresentations of James White. If you want an in-depth biblical session and historical look in Sam's channel. We've done a session on it before, an in-depth one. Tonight, is to re the, the goal is to refute the errors of James White. He continues bringing them up. Now, in the 79th section of the Panarian, we're told by Epiphanius about Mary, like the bodies of the saints, Mary, he's talking about Mary, has been held in honor for her character and her understanding. And if I should say anything more in her praise, hear that. If I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah, who was seen virgin from his mother's womb, always remained so, and was taken up, but has not seen death. Now, we're going to look at the full context of that in a moment. Because James White claims that this is a very poor argument, and he takes aim at Tim Staples and really goes after him. Done it more than one time. He even did a video not long back going after Matt Frad on the Marian dogmas. I mean, give me a break. And every time you hear him attacking the bodily assumption of Mary, attacking the Dormition, he doesn't 
with ever examining the text in the context or fully. We have another father, Timothy of Jerusalem, who's been dated to the 400s. Therefore, the virgin is immortal to this day, he says, talking about her being immortal in heaven, seeing that he who had dwelt in her transported her to the regions of her assumption. That is in his homily in Simeon and Anna. John the theologian, the Lord said to his mother, let your heart rejoice and be glad. For every favor and every gift has been given to you from my Father in heaven. I want you to hear the beautiful Trinitarian language. The beautiful Trinitarian language. From my Father in heaven and from me and from the Holy Spirit, every soul that calls upon your name shall not be ashamed, but shall find mercy and comfort and support and confidence, both in the world that is now and in that which is to come, in the presence of my Father in the heavens and... Pay attention. This is from the 400s. And from that time forth, all knew that the spotless and precious body had been transferred to paradise. Why on earth do we never hear of these other patristic figures? And don't tell me, well, you know, they're not well known. Who knows about them? Because there's a whole book that has been authored by the incredible Father Brian Daly, the Reverend Dr. Dr. Brian, who is one of the top Mariologists, not the top, I'd argue, in my opinion, the very best has got to be Christian Coppice, Father Coppice. There's nobody better than him. He is the man when it comes to Christology and Mariology. But Father Brian Daly is fantastic. He's written a whole book on the Dormition and the Assumption and recognized it's a whole category in the Fathers of writings. Once you get to a particular period of time, he'll tell you, the church is no longer being persecuted as it was before the Constantine era, before Nicaea. The fathers are able to actually write long tomes that have been preserved to worship in public. We finally hear long homilies on the Dormition, on the Assumption of Mary. So it is an outright insult to claim multiple times, well, you know what, the Pope decided to vote on it. And the 1900s found the church. But who believed it beforehand? And then to laugh it up. To laugh it up because you're claiming this wasn't believed before. It is very late. By virtue of how late it is, it must in turn be false. But what he doesn't tell you, he doesn't tell you about the festival days. He doesn't tell you that by the time we get even before the 800s in the Gregorian sacramentary, venerable to us, O Lord, is the feast day, the festival of today on which the Holy Mother of God suffered temporal death because we believe that she is in heaven with our Lord and Savior now, but still could not be kept down by the bonds of death. Who has begotten thy son, our Lord, incarnate from herself? That's a Gregorian sacramentary. You find that kind of language in multiple locations because the festival of the Dormition was celebrated very early on, just like that of the Immaculate Conception. Even though we're not talking about that tonight, I have a relevant book here. It is the definitive edition in Greek of St. Romanos. Romanos the Melodist talks about the actual Immaculate Conception, the actual festival being celebrated, well before his own time, well before his own time. So the idea that these are new, that they were taken out of thin air, as James White has been privy to say as of late, is absolutely ludicrous. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. The Panarian we read, we read Timothy of Jerusalem, we read John, read John the Theologian, and talking about Father Brian Daly, Stay tuned, because in nine days, I am going to be hosting him. I'm going to be talking with one of the top experts in the world on this very field, in this field. We're going to be talking about the work he's been doing, about the new work he's been doing in this field, about his incredible book on the Dormition and on the bodily assumption of Mary. We're going to be talking about all of that. You want to know why I view it as being important? Because I care about doing actual 
theological work in the field of anything that I put forth, of doing my homework, of talking with people that are well-learned, well-versed. James White did a video laughing at the idea that Epiphanius believed in the bodily assumption of Mary. If James White had done his homework, if he would have known, or if he would have even done any kind of relevant homework, he would have realized the top, the top scholars on the assumption of which James is not, recognize that in the Panarian, there's a bodily assumption account occurring. James White made a video laughing. Oh, 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 laughing it up. Is that all you guys got? He said. Let me read it to you one more time. Let me break it down for you. And when I tell you that there, there are a few people that are recognized for being top in their field on the Dormition and the Assumption. One of them, Father Brian Daly, you might be saying, oh, well, William, you know, he's your guy. Well, Stephen Shoemaker's not my guy. Not by any means is he my guy. And if you look at him, those two are considered the top in their field on this topic, on this particular topic. And they both tell you, well, it's very clear that there is a bodily assumption account there. Very clear. The Panarian, we have Epiphanius telling us that, number one, he's arguing against giving Latrue to Mary. We agree. Mary is not to be given worship. Mary is to be given honor, not worship. Worship is, be, is to get, be given to God alone. But then he's very clear. We, we give her honor. He tells us, pay attention. Like the bodies of the saints, however, she has been held in honor for her character and understanding. And then he's about to begin to draw parallels. Pay attention. And if I should say anything more in her praise, she is like Elijah. Okay, we're, 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 we're on... On the, on the track here, uh, Epiphanius, how? How was she like Elijah? Who was virgin from his mother's womb. Okay, she's a perpetual virgin, cool. Okay, always remained so. Okay, and was taken up and has not seen death. Do you catch that parallelism? But there's more. She is like John who leaned on the Lord's breast the disciple whom Jesus loved, the parallelism, the love that Christ has for his mother, the parallelism of Elijah's translation into heaven. She is like St. Tecla. And what is the parallelism there? And because St. Tecla is, being, is given great honor, great honor in the church as a female, incredible honor, so what is the parallelism? Epiphanius, Epiphanius says, and Mary is still more honored than her because of the providence vouch saved her. All of those parallelism, Mary is like them for various reasons. The one of Elijah is the one that is relevant in the night because how? He was taken up. And we're told she's like Elijah. He was taken up. Now, if James White had done his homework, he would have recognized the very Greek word we have there, translated, is the very Greek word you find in the Byzantine lectionaries that recognize the bodily assumption of Mary, the very same Greek word. And if you look up the Greek word in any good Greek lexicon, I'll read you what it says, Liddell and Scott, a common term for ascension, or translation into heaven. A common term for translation into heaven. They didn't teach it that Mary was Mary ascended. The fathers taught that she was translated or bodily assumed by Christ, not by her own power, not by her own glory. But there's more. Had James White done the homework, he would have recognized how poor it was to be going after the text. But Elijah, Epiphany, Epiphanius continues, is not to be worshipped, even though he is alive. And John is not to be worshipped, 
even though by his own proud power, or rather by receiving the grace from God, he made an awesome thing of his dormition. If James White would have continued reading the text, he would have recognized that in the early church there is a tradition of the Dormition of John. You catch that? There's a tradition. Look it up. Type the Dormition of John. It's an early tradition. Now, whereas that tradition is not, we're not making the argument for it, there were people that believed in it. So Epiphanius is drawing that connection, noting the parallels to Mary. But James doesn't go through all of the text. Why? Because it would totally destroy his argument. It would totally destroy his argument. But, you know, we get told, you know, the Pope, 1950s. 1950s declared it to be a dogma. You know, who believed it? Who cares? Who cares about it, whether everybody believed it or not? We're told by James White. Who cares? No, we recognize it was believed even beforehand, which is why in the Vienna document we read, then came the time for the virgin to die, as is allotted to every human being, because she had finished the course of her life and had kept the faith. Portions of this that I'm reading can even be found in Shoemaker. We read, and the apostles spent the entire night in prayer and sang psalms. And at the midnight hour, Mary arose and gave a great prayer to the Lord, while the apostles stood behind her. And when she gave the amen, she laid herself on the bed. And behold, immediately a great perfume spread throughout the entire place, talking about her, her dormition, her death. And a great light was in the house. Christ came to her, and with a great throng of angels, and he said, Peace to you, hail Mary, my mother. Peace to your departure, your departure from this world into another marvelous light. Peace to you, my blessed apostles. Afterward, he turned to Mary, his mother, and said, Oh, Mary, my mother, no power of darkness will come upon you. I am the life of the whole world. Her translation into another world of marvelous light, this document, by several historians, being date, dated to the 100s. Now, what is the very significance of bringing that up? What if, what if one day somebody comes out and says, well, you know, it was written in the 200s or 300s? At the end of the day, we've got historians arguing for a very early dating of it. It doesn't take away the incredibly early dating of those other fathers we've read of the tr tradition that Epiph Epiphanius tells us the church recognized. The church recognizes tradition. Now there is a homily that is very long that I'm going to read, you know, little portions to you of. We'll read little portions because the homily is on the death of Mary, on the dormition of Mary, and her bodily assumption into heaven. Now, I, I, I'll, I won't tell you who wrote it yet. I will tell you it is, it is early. I'll even give you a little clue. It's before the 400s, but and before the 500s, excuse me, it's in the 400s. But what is the significance of it? When we get to the conclusion, and I'm not going to read all of it, I'll read little portions here and there. For anybody that does want the whole, the whole homily, I believe you can only find it in one book, but reach out to me and I'll get it to you. Or I'll give it to Sam. Sam can load it up to his blog for everybody to read. We're going to find out why this homily is so important at the very end. And it goes to the heart of the issue from James White that, well, 1950s, you know, really late, very late in history. Who believed it before? There were very few people, you know, it gets believed very late, very, very late in church history. Even the argument that White has brought up before, I believe he brought it up in debate, or might, might have brought it up in his book, that there are no early councils that taught this. 
Remember, the pedigree of an early church council, even if not ecumenical, would be indicative of a belief being prevalent, heavily prevalent, in a particular region. You cannot remove the emphasis on local early councils. Now, were there early councils that were robber councils or bad? Sure. But we're not talking about those. We're talking about early councils that were attended by individuals that were not heretical. Son, who in your love inclined to heaven and descended to earth and put on a body and became man from the daughter of David. Only begotten son who fashioned man from nothing. Restore the discourse in my weary mind that I may sing to you. So what we have here is a, a beautiful kind of um, a poetry of words being utilized, being shown um, about, the, about the death of Mary. One that we recognize very often in the Dormition and in the Assumption homilies of Mary are the hearkening to the incredible Psalms. Now, why is that so? Why is it so? Because people recognize the language utilized in all of the Old Testament, all over the place, of the Ark of the Covenant and how the language in the New Testament shows Mary as that new Ark of the New Covenant and how the early fathers recognized that. It is no wonder then, by the time we get to the Dormition, an assumption of Mary homilies, you have amazing fathers like John Dam Damascus, Germanus of Constantinople and others that begin to hearken to the Psalms, begin to hearken to other books in the Old Testament. They begin to read the texts of the Ark of the Covenant and then note that the new Ark has gone to be with her son. That is why there is so much hearkening. That is why it becomes so prevalent in the Dormition and the Assumption of Mary homilies. But let us continue reading what I'm reading because I want you all to know the name of the author after we get to the end and what kind of importance we attach to this letter. After that, we will have proven there are early fathers, indeed there are more, I only read a few, that to the contrary of James White taught the bodily assumption, the Dormition. We will have shown that James White is wrong in Epiphanius, the video he did, did in it attacking the truth that comes from Epiphanius. And it is not only my opinion, but that of scholars, not all that are on my side either, to show that I am being fair with the evidence, we will have shown there even is an early council that taught this truth. And we will also briefly touch upon the comments that James White made, that James White made about the perpetual virginity of Mary, which he did briefly again. And the arguments you hear James White utilizing every time you hear him talking about Mary he fires up the computer. I don't know where he's, he, did he, he probably has an old uh, jump drive where all of his old PowerPoints have been saved. He'll fire up an image that looks like it's come out of 1991 and begin reading all of the old stuff he's written about Mary. All of the old stuff. Stuff that has been ripped to shreds long ago. Totally, totally crushed. He'll begin utilizing it as if, well, you know, William has never refuted that. Nobody's ever dealt with that before. And you'll begin reading it, you know, utilizing people like Fulgentius of Rusty, even though I've totally replied to that. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares about context? Oh, hidden one, you are who are concealed even from the watchers that they do not see you. Shine upon me in stillness so that, that I may proclaim openly about your mother. 
Oh, you who were cherished with lullabies by the pure mother, may my tongue pour forth all praise of your sweetness. Your mother endured many sufferings for your sake. Every grief encompassed her at your crucifixion. How much sighing and sorrowful tears did her eyes shed when they enshrouded you and brought you to rest within the tomb? How much terror the mother of mercy felt at your burial when the guards at the sepulcher seized her lest she draw near to you? So just really incredible language continually being used for his mother Mary. And indeed there's more. We're going to read more. Uh, it's a whole homily just on Mary, just on the Dormition of Mary and the bodily assumption. So the author is building it up by showing, saying, Lord, enlighten me. Lord, fill me with your spirit. And what a relevant day we are talking about today. I love talking about our Immaculate Mother. I love talking about our bodily risen Lord. Today is the festival day of St. Apollonius, who told the people that were going to put him to death in the 200s that I, I will not fight it. I will not. I will not reject my Lord and Savior. I will go to my martyrdom because I know there is eternal life in he who rose from the dead. What a relevant, incredible day it is today. That feast day of that great martyr who is now rejoicing with the saints who surround us in heaven with our Lord. The author, though, continues. On this day, he's talking about the glorification, and, and the headline says, the glorification of the mother of God. On this day, Adam rejoices, and even in Eve, his wife, because their daughter rests in the place which they are gathered. On this day, the righteous Noah and Abraham rejoice that their daughter has visited them in their dwelling place. On this day, Jacob, the honorable, honorable old man, rejoices that the daughter who sprouted from his root has called him to life. On this day, the twelve just sons of the lame rejoice greatly and are glad in that she visited them. On this day, let also Judah rejoice greatly for the behold, the daughter who was given life went forth from his loins on this day joseph rejoiced and the great moses for one young maiden has called all mankind to life on this day let aaron rejoice and eliezer eliezer and all the tribe of the sons of levi levi with their priesthood on this day let david the renowned forefather rejoice because the daughter who was from him has placed a glorious crown on his head on this day, let Samuel rejoice with Jeremiah because the daughter of Judah dropped dew on their bones. Notice the incredible language being utilized for what? For the presence of a certain female in heaven. On this day, let also Isaiah the prophet rejoice because she whom he prophesied, behold, she visits him. On this day, all the prophets lifted their heads from their graves because they saw the light which shone forth on them. They saw that death is disquieted and flees from within them. And the gates of heaven are opened again and the depths of the earth. The prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and priests who were gathered together, also the teachers and the patriarchs and the righteous ones of old. In heaven, the watchers, in the depths, man, in the air, in the air, glory. When the Virgin Mary was buried as one deceased, a light shone on that company of disciples, also on her neighbors and her relations and her kindred. And then language that is very familiar once we get to later, later Dormition and Assumption homilies. The heavenly company, company performed their holy, holy, holy under the glorious soul of the mother of the Son of God. Fire ye seraphim, surrounded the soul of the departed and raised the loud sound of their joyful shouts. They shouted and said, lift up, O gates, all your heads, because the mother of the king seeks to enter the bridal chamber of life. Heaven was full of the sweet music of the angels, but the depths were troubled. 
Together with the disciples who were filled with grief, the church on high and that below cried with one hymn. So we continue onwards to read, she wove a beautiful crown and set it on her sublime head on which valuable pearls were laid. On and on you read of the incredible language being utilized here, the amazing language of an individual, this one being the mother of Mary, entering bodily into heaven at the end of the discourse of her life, as this author says. But in the end, all glory goes to God. O bridegroom Christ, he says. This is very important because at the end of this very important text, O bridegroom Christ, to you be praised from every mouth, and on us be mercy at all times. Amen, amen. I still haven't told you the name of this figure, but one thing very important to recognize is every incredible thing done for Mary, Mary's sinlessness, Mary's assumption into heaven, None of it is because of any good deed Mary did. That must be careful. When, be, be very careful. When we say Mary was sinless, that comes from the grace of God. There's no way that we could say she has a sinless nature like our Lord and Savior. By his very nature, divine nature, our God our Lord and Savior, who became incarnate for our sake, is sinless. Mary's sinlessness is because of grace. And so her assumption as well, because she did not ascend, that was because of grace as well. Notice how they're all incredibly connected, which is why Jacob of Sarug was able to say this kind of language. And I know Sam is probably smiling at the fact that I'm bringing up a Syriac Church father, an important figure as well, who in the past, of course, people would have argued, well, you know what, we're not too certain about his theology. No, Jacob of Sarag's theology is perfectly fine. His Christology is perfectly fine as well. He's one of the greatest saints of the Syriac church, one of the greatest. And you might be wondering and saying, well, okay, William, you, got, you have a homily from Jacob about the Dormition and the Assumption of Mary. You know, a lot of really nice, a lot of really beautiful language. So what? The very incredible significance of the homily from Jacob of Sarug is the fact that he delivered that homily to a council in Nisibis before the 500s. He delivered that homily. So Jacob of Sarug has a very large corpus of homilies. And in them, as the great father Brian Daly notes, and I'm going to read from Brian Daly. He says, Jacob of Sarug's vast corpus of homilies include a sermon of 110 lines on the subject of Mary's death and glorious reception into heaven, which was delivered to a church council in 489. Now, what do we know of the church council? We don't know much other than the fact that it was delivered to a church council, meaning that there was a church council well before 1950, James, which talked about, recognized well before this, because it had it already, it was already believed. It was already a well entrenched teaching in the church. And here they are teaching about the, bod the dormition of Mary and the bodily assumption of Mary into heaven, her glorious reception into heaven. And I will probably ask Father Brian Daly about that when we, when we talk. Now, people that will wonder and say, well, you know, is everything in there uh, true? 
what is true is the early church recognized the Dormition of Mary and the bodily assumption of Mary. Note that a lot of early fathers provide poetic images where they insert beautiful language about Mary, about the prophets, about the apostles, about Christ. They insert incredible beauty, beautiful language to emphasize this truth that was believed by the early ancient church. That beautiful poetic language was a thing that was very prevalent in the church. It was very prevalent, especially in the Syriac fathers, because you find it as well in Ephraim the Syrian, using very similar, incredible poetic language about Mary. So we have an early council. We have early fathers. We know that this was a festival well before the 1950s, well before the 1900s. Why are we told? Why do we continue hearing the argument? Look, I could argue against the Dormition Assumption better than James. Why not merely argue, well, you know what? Uh, they were lying. You know, lying about it. You know, they didn't really get any kind of ancient teaching, ancient truth. Rather than arguing, trying to make it seem like these doctrines, these dogmas were not believed until very late in early church history, and they were taken from heretical literature. We're told that the perpetual virginity of Mary comes from Gnostic documents? What on earth? We're told the bodily assumption comes from the transitus literature that was condemned. I've nowhere even read any of the translators literature tonight, and I've shown you early fathers. I've shown you they believed in this tradition, in this teaching. I've shown you that. I've shown you an early council that taught it as well. And nowhere do you find me relying upon transitus literature. Nowhere do you find that. Do you find me relying on that or making an argument for that? Now, there are many more arguments to be used many more fathers, but I think that to be sufficient to show that James White has got to do his homework better, period. I'm I have grown very tired of every time I get sent a video that James White has done, I put it on hoping, well, I'm going to have him engage with new material that I've brought up, with new arguments that I brought up, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally view it. And we have the laptop fired up and the PowerPoint from 1998 fired up and the old arguments that have been ripped apart more than I've lost track already being utilized. But I've got to be quite honest with you. If James White wanted to have a meaningful dialogue, meaningful talk about the Marian dogmas, he could. I know a lot of Protestants that I've had very friendly dialogues about the Marian dogmas. I had hoped to have, I had hoped to have a debate with Tony Costa on the perpetual virginity of Mary and a I've got nothing bad to say about the brother, Dominic Costa. He's a friend of mine. I dialogue with him. I was very, very much looking forward to that debate. And it didn't happen. If you know Tony, if you're a friend of him, reach out to him. Say, you know, Tony, I'd love to see you debate William the way you were going to debate him. The debate didn't happen. And I was told uh, he'd reach back out to me about the middle of the month. The middle of the month is pastory of uh, 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 an important discussion can be had in a charitable way. And anybody that does watch my debates has noted, I know to treat my opponent well, I'm not going to be a bully or being mean to James White. James White knows where to find me if he ever wants to debate these topics. We're told that the perpetual rigidity of Mary comes from Gnostic documents. By the way, arguing that the Proto-Evangelium of James 
has tinges of Gnosticism. Try to find a scholar that says that. Try to. Nobody's arguing the Proto-Evangelium of James is biblical. We're not arguing that. But the Proto-Evangelium of James does teach the perpetual rigidity. He's mad about that. But we don't have to rely on that. And where on earth did Jerome rely on the Proto-Evangelium of James? If Jerome, when defending the perpetual rigidity of James, doesn't teach the very same theology found in the Proto-Evangelium of James, yet he defends the perpetual rigidity of Mary, where on earth is he relying on that? In fact, here is the irony. The very first figures that you encounter that deny the perpetual rigidity in mass, you don't find any truly church fathers doing it, none of them, are, funny enough, Arians and proto-Arians. If you get your Mariology wrong, you're very likely to get your Christology wrong. Very likely. Bishop Bonasus, Helvidius, people that were heretics at Ambrose crushed Bonasus. Jerome crushed Helvidius. These were incredible church fathers. Pillars of the faith. You don't, you don't venerate a Bishop Bonasus. When did you ever go to church and hear, have a Bible study and hear the homilies of Bishop Bonasus? You probably never even heard of him. When did you go to a church Bible study, even if you're evangelical, if you're Baptist, or whatever you are? By the way, I consider you my brothers. Whatever you may be, when have you gone to a church gathering and heard of well, you know, we'll, you know, we're going to read, uh, you know, we're going to read about um, uh, you know, Saint Helvidius. When there were heretics that were condemned, condemned in the early church, for one, not only their Mariology but their Christology was horrible, denying the divinity of Christ, believing in Arian theology and Proto-Arian theology as their contemporaries reported. Not only their enemies, not only Ambrose. I know I'm not. I'm not dumb. Oh you know, well, William. You know you only get into testimony of Ambrose and and Jerome. No, I'm talking about their contemporaries as well. I'm talking about church historians that would note, such as Scholarius, that would note that there were Arians that throughout history that that teaching was well known. So where are? The heretics are the ones that are denying the perpetual virginity of Mary, not the other way around. And to claim, as James White did in the video he did not too long ago, that we get it from Gnostic sources would be a slap in the face to Clement of Alexandria, writing before the year 200, who used the argument that as the scriptures are pure and they're perpetually pure, so Mary continues in life like the scriptures, perpetually pure. In Istromata, book 7, chapter 16. So Gregory the Wonder Worker as well, in the mid-200s, would have taught the very same thing. Where do any of these individuals tell you, well, you know what, we're, we're grabbing from the, the Proto-Evangelium. We don't know about it anywhere before. Before the Nicene era, I'm reading Church Fathers to you. What, a, what an embarrassment to the Church of Syria, who the great Ephraim showed no veneration of the Proto-Evangelium of James, disconnected from the West in another part of the world, teaching low, in the year 330, low a virgin has become a mother, preserving virginity with its seals unbroken, Mary was the virgin inviolate in his hymns on the Blessed Mother. We've gone to all parts of the world, Alexandria, Syria, everywhere you look, it was taught in a manner that is consistent with Catholicity, meaning it is universal. Don't insult our brothers from the various ancient churches just because you don't know about them. 
Don't insult the Assyrian Church of the East. Don't insult the Syriac brothers. Don't insult our, or our other Eastern Russian brothers. Don't do it by telling them, well, it took to 1950 or it took to the late 1800s to, for it to become believed or followed in a wide manner. When you have them believing it all around the ancient world from the very beginning. It just doesn't make any sense. Every time I fire up a new video of James White, it is the very same argumentation being brought up. If you are sure about your arguments, James, come debate them. Been trying to get the debate done. Come debate them. We've offered you an open challenge on reason and theology. I've offered you debate me on Sam's channel. He can moderate it. He'll be an, an impartial moderator. Get the debate done on any of the Marian dogmas that you want. Any of them. You bragged in a video you made. Well, you know what? We have to go to them. They don't come to us to debate anymore. It is no longer an argument that you can throw in my face that, well, William, um, you know what? You've got a you have to accomplish whatever, whatever, before I ever take you seriously to debate or whatever, whatever. Enough of it already. Enough. I've been doing this for nearly two decades already. I've debated over 60 times already. I've lost count how many debates I've had. The final time that I debated with James in his show, he hung up on me. For people that might not, not, not know the back story, I was refuting James in the Deuterocanon, Canon where he told the audience, well, I cut him off. You know, I hung up. I didn't mean to hang up. But in reality, I was on the air and he muted me because I could continue him talking. I, I could continue hearing him talk. I heard him tell the audience I didn't mean to hang up on him, meaning I hadn't been hung up on. I was on mute and then I was hung up on. But that was a long time ago. I Water under the bridge. I'm not mad. These are vitally important topics we need to talk about that people want to hear about. They want to know, can you provide a reply to any of these arguments? Indeed, there are a number of articles that we've been putting out, churning out. My very good friend, Father Coppice and myself, we're going to be coming out with a book, another book on Mary soon, on the perpetual virginity alone, on that topic alone. I'd love to get the address of Eric Svensson, send it over to him. I don't know. I don't know the address. I don't even know what happened to him. But the point being, we know the arguments. We've replied to them a long time ago. Now, we've, we're, we've thrown the ball to your end. The ball is in your court. When are you going to reply? When are you going to come and debate the issues? When are you going to finally come and admit, well, you know what, I'm wrong on all of that? Or you know what, James, if you're not wrong on all of that, and if you're right on all of that, and if we're wrong, then come and debate the issues. Use those slideshows from 1981. Use the floppy from the 1980s. Repeat what you've been repeating for a long time. And, well, if it does stand up to the test of time, well, then you, you've proven your point on the Marian dogmas. But today, have a little bit of respect for the ancient churches of the world. Have a little bit of respect because they don't yield to the Pope. And to tell your audience, well, you know what it took? 1950s to finally start believing that. You've got people that are Oriental Orthodox scratching their head. Like what? Wait, the Pope? The, the, Pope made a, the Pope made a decree and now, now we, we believe it? What are you talking about? We've been disconnected from Rome for a while. And you're telling us that it took the Pope to decree that? For us to believe that? What are you talking about? This is what I'm talking about being disconnected from reality, living in your Calvinist mindset world 
when in your mind there are only two other churches it's catholicism and orthodoxy all the orthodox believe the same thing in that kind of mentality with that kind of mentality well you're right when it comes to mary though that you are right about but with that kind of mentality it is no wonder you don't want to debate the marian dogmas but i will repeat what i have told you before as long as the good lord allows me to tarry as long as the good lord allows it every time you do a video every time you put out an article even if you put out a book on mary anything i will be right around the corner waiting for you and i will refute you every time the video that you put out to two of them were given to me via uh facebook i didn't go look for them they were given to me and i shook my head james is at it again now though as you told me, you didn't bring up my name now. You didn't. But yet you took aim at everything that has been refuted before. But I will be waiting every time you do a video on Mary, every time you write an article, I'll be waiting to refute that. And I'd be shocked if you deal with any of the material that we've put out, which has been a lot already. With that being said, People that are tuning in from any of the ancient faiths, even my Protestant brothers and sisters, I love you from the bottom of my heart because we share that incredible truth of our Trinitarian faith. And what, what part of the year are we in? We're in the year we're celebrating the bodily resurrection of Christ. I know some people in some part of the world um, celebrate in May. I'll be celebrating right along with you because in reality, everyone a part of the ancient church or everybody that believes you should be trumpeting the truth of the bodily resurrection of our Lord and Savior every day of your life. Every day, wake up, thank the good Lord for giving you another day, and recognize that the Lord is truly risen, bodily risen. Thank you. Okay, guys, before we go to Q&A, this is your channel. Let me see, can I? All right, I'm gonna, it's okay. Sorry about that. I look older than I am. <laughs> All right, guys, this is your time for Q&A. Remember, there's a 20-second delay, but I just want to say a few things before we begin. Number one, I just gave you the link, which is posted on my blog. William was kind enough to send me a file with the early church father's explicit affirmation of the perpetual virginity of the Blessed Mother of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Blessed yeah. Mother. So there's a link. Now, you have my full authorization to take all of my sessions all of my articles upload them to your channels to your sites clip them translate them the yep. reason why i had william come here is so that we can get more subscribers to his youtube channel more views for these videos and i want okay. his channel to go viral by the grace of the lord jesus christ so that's why he knows my stuff is his stuff he doesn't even need to ask me he can upload it to his channel Amen. so that's number one number two let me just comment real quickly and I pray the Lord Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, saves us from unrighteous anger, unholy indignation. May the Lord Jesus save us from slander, gossip. May the Lord Jesus purify us to truly love him and fear the Lord Jesus, even when we criticize people that we do not like. Yep. Only God knows definitely James White's heart. I can only assess him by his fruits, because the Lord says, by their fruits you shall know them. My suspicion, from what I see, the reason why William Link, I'm sorry, William, I'm sorry. <laughs> William, I'm thinking William McCary. The reason why James White won't debate William or Michael is because, number one, he's got a lot to lose because, and I know this for a fact, William will smoke him in a debate, and he does it very charitably. His debates are proof. He's very charitable when he decimates objections. So no one can use an excuse that he's nasty or rude. Yep. And so he knows he won't be able to outwit or use rhetoric to undermine the arguments because the facts of history is on William's side. Yep. So that's number one. Number two, what James is interested in doing from what I see, only God knows his heart. And if I'm wrong, the Lord forgive me. What James wants to do is tap into 
major apologetic organizations that have hundreds of thousands of people because he wants to tap into their market. He did that with Islam. James White buddied up to me, David Wood, Nabil Qureshi, pretty much used us in order to tap into our market, in order for us to give him respect and legitimize him in the eyes of Christians doing work with Muslims and to then tap into the Muslim apologists that we knew. And once he tapped into that market, he pretty much threw all of us under the bus, started criticizing Nabil Qureshi. Don't take my word for it. Oh, I know that. Yep. So, brother, you're saying? Brother, oh, I know that. I saw a video where I was horrified where he, he really targeted the brother Nabil. I know what you're talking about. Yes. In fact, here's what I want you guys to do to, to prove my point. Go to a Muslim channel known, known as Muslim, Muslim by choice. I think that's the name because I pretty much, I, I can't stand that channel because it's full of slander. Guys, do me a favor, please. Can you do me a favor? I don't want you to take my word for it. I'm a sinner. I'm tainted. I can even see things in a way that's not, that does not correspond to reality the way God sees it because of my sinfulness and may the Lord Jesus save me from that. Lord Jesus, please, I beg you, save us for your glory. Save us from our skewed perception of reality. See things the way you see because you are reality, you are truth. We beg you, Lord Jesus. So what I want you to do, please, please, if you love me and respect me, do me a favor, please. Go to Muslim by Choice yep. website, uh, YouTube channel. Type in James White. This man, he loves James White. He, he has several dozen clips from James White's dividing line where he is attacking Nabil Qureshi, attacking David Wood, attacking Robert Spencer, attacking me. These Muslims love James White. These Muslims love James White. Okay, what's my point? The reason why he won't debate William, as I said, two reasons, because William will smoke him. He will. I know that. And I'm not just saying in front of William. But also because William does not have as many supporters yet. But if the Lord Jesus tarries, may the Lord Jesus increase his support. That's why you have to make us go viral, our channels go viral. Because yeah. as of Thursday, James White did a dividing line. Here it is. Let me give you the link. He did a dividing line. Guess who his target is? Catholic Answers and Trent Horn. Why does he go after a Trent Horn Catholic Answers? Here it is. James White, April 15, 2021. Church Fathers, Church History, Debate, Roman Catholicism. Continued our response to Trent Horn's Protestant Distortions of Church History Lecture from 2019. Delving into the Didache, Didache which he uses inconsistently, because that same Didache would expose him as a heretic. But hey, James White, Sola Widia. Solely white. Priesthood, Irenaeus, and likewise, discussing proposed debate topics with Catholic Answers. So okay. you're keen to propose debate topics with Catholic Answers. Here, William and Michael Laughlin have been begging you to debate them. Why don't you debate them? Because James White is smart. He wants to tap into their, their base. Because Catholic Answers International... Hundreds of thousands of viewers, hundreds of thousands of subscribers. Of course, James White wants to debate them because they will then give him access to their supporters. And that means more people coming to James White's channel. You see how clever, how deceitful, how wickedly dishonest that is? Again, if I'm wrong, Lord Jesus, forgive me, but I can only go by his fruits. See? And this yep. is why... No, you're right, brother. You, you, you're, you're totally right. Um, <clears throat> to add to that, um, Sam is not wrong. If you if you look up on YouTube, there are a number of Muslims which they love James White. They love him. Yeah. And I'm not even joking with you. Um, let me give you one example. I did a stream maybe about a month ago where I was talking about Islam and I brought up James White, and you have people in the common chat that were Muslim that began to defend him. Yep. Can you believe that? Of course. No, I know wow. that. In fact, if you want proof, guys, watch the debate between David Wood and Muhammad Hijab, Mimi Nakab. 
You'll see Muhammad Hijab says, you're not a respectable person like James White and William Lane Craig. See, James White. He kept using James White to bash David Wood. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on me. May I not hate this man. But may the Lord Jesus either grant him repentance or give him what he deserves. Because, folks, this is the honest to God truth. James White is the most hated apologist, and for good reasons. Not because he's some kind of gift to the church and he's following the standard of Christianity that others are failing to follow and therefore they're into he is so repulsively arrogant and disgusting that even Reformed Baptists, his own denomination, there are people who cannot stand him. There are Calvinists who cannot stand him. He's hated across the board because again, I have to be honest, brethren, I'm sorry. God forgive me. It may come off as slander, but I'm saying it publicly so he can hear it to his face. He is a narcissist. And the only way you can cure a narcissist is the work of the Holy Spirit. So may the Lord grant him repentance or give him what he deserves. And the best thing for James White is he needs to step away. And speaking of which, and this is my last point on James, and we're going to open up the Q&A. One of his biggest groupies is Ken, uh, Ken Temple. Ken Temple had the audacity to send me an email again. Now, I don't read his emails. I just see the title of the email. This time he's trying to butter me up. Oh, good job on Genesis 22 and... Uh, refuting Paul Williams. And I know Ken is watching me. Ken, please, for the love of the Lord Jesus, please, Ken, I don't care for your opinion. I don't care for you or your opinion. Can you stop sending me emails, please? <laughs> I don't know what to say, dude. Please stop. I don't want your email. I don't want your praise. I don't want your rebuke. I don't care. Stop emailing me, Ken, please. I don't know what to do, man. Stop. Now, that said, some announcements and Q&A. Guys, here's your chance to ask questions of this brother. Lord willing, I'll be doing a session tomorrow finishing my response to Paul Williams. Lord willing, this week, if the Lord is pleased, I'm going to finish the second part of my response to James White's butchering of Justin Martyr. Lord willing, that's coming. Lord willing, I'll be doing some sessions this week, finishing my series of refutation to the Joe's Witnesses on the Trinity on 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6. And the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed, as well as the Lord's Prayer. I plan on doing sessions this week. Pray for a good crowd. We got over 300 tonight. Glory to Jesus. May the numbers increase. Lord, bring 500, 600 strong for your Amen. glory, not for our praise. And Lord Jesus willing, I'm gonna, and then I'm going to mention it to you because I just remembered. For those of you in Florida, I will be in Miami, Lord willing, Friday till Sunday. Lord willing, next stop, Miami. So, guys, you in Florida... If you're in Miami or it's neighboring environs, I'm there, Lord willing, Friday till Sunday in Miami, Lord Jesus willing. So if you want to see me, contact me on Skype or Facebook, which means, brother, if we can do our session Thursday, because I'll be driving for three hours. I just remembered. It's up to you. We'll do it. We'll do it, brother. We will. Okay. So that said, we got a first question. Oh, by the way, James Snap has joined us, a beast when it comes to New Testament textual criticism. We had a double header. James Snap schooled James White on the issue of the text of the New Testament. So, guys, can you can you see? Imagine this. James Snap exposed James White's misinformation, ignorance, errors about the preservation and transmission of the New Testament. We did that session several hours ago. It's now on my YouTube channel. Please watch it. Make that session go viral. You can upload it. Please take my stuff, upload them, make clips out of them, translate them. Glory to Jesus. And now you have William educating James White, exposing his lies, misinformation on church history. So you got a double header. Study those <clears throat> sessions, learn them, pass them on for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, Amen. that said, first question, I think <clears throat> this is again. William and Father Capus has been on my channel. We've done several sessions related to the Blessed Mother of our Lord. And William did a session on the Immaculate Conception. And I think it's related to it, but maybe you want to take it. Hold on. Where's the comment? Sure, brother. It has to do with, okay. Uh, okay, this question, I used to ask this when I was very hostile towards the Catholic doctrines. It's, uh, Zach, I think it's relevant because uh, I heard this from Eric Svensson, by the way who has disappeared since then. But here's the argument. Though not related, but it is related, because you mentioned the perpetual virginity of our Blessed Mother. And related to that would be, you know, because her dying, if she's sinless. You know, but you get the point. Yeah. Anyway, 
Oh, yeah. If Mary had to be sinless for Jesus to receive sinless flesh, why did Mary's mother not need to be sinless? That's an objection here all the time. Well, how would you answer that? It's a great one. So number one, you hear that all the time. I want people to be very clear. The Immaculate Conception is a very, very broad dogma, which really it is very easy to make the kind of mistake Zach is making here. The church has never taught. In fact, you don't find the massive majority of fathers ever saying Mary had to be sinless for Christ to receive sinless flesh. Flesh, Indeed, our Lord and Savior would not have had those kind of limitations put on him at all. That is not taught. That's not part and parcel with a dogma, with a doctrine. So I know I've heard, I recognize, I want people to realize, I'm not going to call out any names. I've heard some Catholics bring up that argument. It's not taught by the church. Were there any fathers that taught that? Sure, there were some church fathers that taught that. I believe even maybe Leo taught that. But if you look and you look at Leo's tome, Leo is very clear that Christ got his sinless nature, human nature, from the mother, but he doesn't then in turn argue that, well, it had to be that way. Uh, if it wasn't, he would have, uh, the sin would have been transmitted to him. The church doesn't argue that. The reason being because Mary's sinless nature is all by grace. None of it is merited. That is a very important point we have to point out. This question I want to just partly address uh, because, like I said, when I used to be more anti-Catholic pro James White, I used to use some of his arguments. Let me just give you one just quick response to James, and then the brother can answer. Uh, James White's whole point is that you don't find a sacerdotal priesthood in the early centuries of the church. That was later. Uh, so let me repeat the question because I'm going to move it from the screen so you can see your handsome face. What do you think of James' comments on the priesthood? I've seen Father Pacwa defend it, and I thought he did well. Now, let me explain what the brother is referring to, uh, that you don't find a sacerdotal priesthood, meaning a separate, distinct office of priesthood from the priesthood of believers uh, in the early centuries of the church. It's a later development, and therefore, this somehow nullifies the Eucharist being the actual body, blood, soul, divinity of our Lord, because you need a priest to pray and consecrate the host for it to become the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, if you don't have a sacerdotal priesthood, that means you don't have any evidence that early on the Eucharist was believed to be a sacrifice and that the elements were then consecrated by prayer to become the actual sacrifice of Jesus. Now, I just want to share something. This is what turned me off from James White. Okay, guys, let me explain to you why this was one of the many reasons where I just got disgusted with his argumentation, and I have to be honest. James White will use church fathers to try to attack Catholic beliefs and will not allow for development when it goes against what he believes. Why do I say that? Because you can show, you can show, from Ignatius, what's known as a monarchical episcopate. Let me explain what I mean. Guys, please, this, you need to listen to this. We're giving you meat here. A monarchical episcopate is the belief that in each particular jurisdiction or church, you have a chief bishop ruling over the local body of believers, underneath him a college of presbyters, elders, bishops, who are subject to the chief bishop, and underneath them are deacons. So you have a chief bishop, presbyters, elders. You can call them bishops as well, but they are subject to this chief bishop, and underneath them are deacons. You find evidence for what's known as the monarchical episcopate yep. in the writings of Ignatius, who's the bishop of the church at Antioch, Syria. Why is this important? Because James White salivates over Ignatius. Ignatius wrote seven letters on his way to being martyred at Rome, begging the Christians at Rome not to stop him from being fed to the lions because he wants to die as a sacrifice for the Lord Jesus because he loves Jesus more than his life. In those letters, six of those letters, he, he greets the bishop and he exhorts Christians and he says, submit to the bishop, that one bishop as you submit to Christ. So the bishop represents Christ. The presbyters are subject to the bishop. The deacons are subject to the presbyters who are subject to the bishop. And yet James White ignores that structure of the church 
because he believes in a plurality of elders. Do you see the wicked dishonesty of James White? So you're going to quote Ignatius when it comes to his view of the Trinity. You're going to quote Ignatius when, his, when he has a high view of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you're going to reject Ignatius' explicit testimony that every church that he writes to, with the exception of Rome, and doesn't mean because there wasn't a monarchical episcopate functioning there, contrary to James White's selective citation of scholars, you're going to ignore that in Ephesus, Philippians, Antioch, major seats of Christianity, Ignatius acknowledges this structure of the church as functioning in the lifetime of the apostles. Because who's Ignatius? A disciple of the apostles. Who appointed him? The apostles. He knew John. And he's saying this is the structure of the church that comes in the lifetime of the apostles. You're going to reject that for plurality of elders, and you have the audacity to argue there wasn't an early sacerdotal priesthood. You are wicked and dishonest, to say the least. But that's my two cents worth, brother. What do you say? You're 100% correct, brother, because in his letter to the Ephesians, he tells us bishops settled everywhere to the utmost bounds of the earth are appointed by the will of Christ. You bring up a really good point, because for Ignatius, I remember very clearly, bishop, episcopos, was a term that always referred to the presbyter that shepherded a given regional church. For him, this meant that all the churches in the world had this model, including, as you bring up, the one in Rome. It was really, really a terrible argument, brother. I totally agree with you. And I think the one area where James White does go to in, in talking about Jerome, totally ripping that out of context. And I've got my notes on that somewhere, but he's totally ripping out of the context. If you ever want to do a question, context. brother, we can come refute him on we, that. We will do that. I, I didn't know that he had been talking about that. We will do that. Mm -hmm. I'm up for that, brother. Yeah, he's been doing that in his response to Trent Horn. That's why, if you watch, I did part one, James White's misuse of Justin Martyr. So I'm going to do part two. So if you want, I know it's going to kill you to listen to him. Listen to his response to Trent Horn. See what he says about the sacerdotal priesthood. I will. And my channel is your channel. You come in. We can talk about it. But let me repeat a point I made for the benefit of the other brothers and sisters here who may have not listened to my session. Let's assume there was no sacerdotal priesthood early on. Let's assume the only thing you have early on is bishops or the bishop. Let me repeat myself because when I say bishops, I'm using the term to refer to a chief bishop presiding as the head over other bishops, over deacons. But let's just, so I don't confuse people. Chief bishop, presbyters under him, deacons under them. So what we call a three-tiered hierarchical structure of authority over the church. Bishop, presbyters, deacons. So let's assume there wasn't this office of priesthood distinct from what we call the priesthood of believers. Let's assume he's right. Because James White thinks he's intelligent. This is what kills me about the brother. Yep. Uh, okay, see, no sacerdotal priesthood. All believers were priests. Royal, you know, a, a priesthood of believers. In one sense, we are all priests. No one denies that. No Catholic deny that I, as a Christian, am a priest called to offer my body as a living sacrifice and offer my Lord spiritual sacrifices, which is my priestly duty. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. And verses 9 and 10. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. 1 Peter 2, verse 5 and verses 9 and 10. So let's assume he's right. Catholics, let's assume he's right. Early on, there was no sacerdotal priesthood. But hold on, uh, James. Isn't the bishop, by virtue of being a believer, a priest? Because remember, the priesthood of all believers, right? All believers are priests. Doesn't that mean the bishop is a priest? Yes, and not only is he a priest, but he's also appointed by Christ to be the leader of the church. Yes. So that means we must submit to him who desires to submit to Christ and exemplify Christ in the way he leads over us. Yes. So the bishop is the leader of the church and the bishop is a priest. So as a priest who is now the leader of the church, that means he has the authority to consecrate those to become the body and blood of Christ. So what in the world is your objection exactly? So I'm know. totally with you there, brother. They're really, really, the really terrible arguments that James White puts forth. And I, and I can tell why, even by the way, for people that are wondering, even the brother Sam here 
has challenged uh, James to debate in the past, and of course, that won't happen. Yeah. By the way, Mustafa speaks. Instead of barking like a dog, like your prophet, give him my Skype, Mustafa. After I'm done with William, if you do not call me, I will spread camel urine on your prophet, that bastard who's burning in hell. Call me on Skype and debate me and be more man than Aisha. You disgust me because you are a filthy dog who has no honor to defend your prophet. Prove me wrong. My Skype will be open. If not, you're never coming back to my channel. May the Lord Jesus use me to further add to Muhammad's torment in hell in Jesus' name. Now, with that said, anyone have any questions related to the topic? Anyone have a question related to the topic? No one? Come on, guys. This brother here is sacrificing his time to answer questions. Good crowd, by the way. We had over 300. Amen, brother. And Jesus Amen. Numbers increase for the glory of Christ. Go ahead. And, I, and I'll open it up a little bit for the people that um, anything Mary related. You don't have to. You don't yes. have to. Not only the the, the dormition, not only the the assumption or perpetual. Any, anything, anything Mary related. Feel free to pick my brain now. Now is you all's time. All right. Here's one. Long. I love his name, but I can't pronounce it. Long Genus of Jerusalem. Can William quickly comment on Ezekiel 44, verses 23? This is talking about only the Lord will enter through the east gate. In yeah. reference to perpetual Virginia Mary, in Psalm 132, 8 to 9, about the Lord arising with his ark. In reference yeah, to the assumption. No. Sorry if this is too much. No, not at all, brother. I love the name Longinus, um, the, the very venerated saint. Um, I believe, uh, I might be wrong here. I don't want to embarrass myself. I think it was a saint that, um, and maybe you know, brother, that... Uh, that uh, stuck the spear into Christ. He became a, a believer later. I think. I think that is the name of the saint. I think. I think I could be correct about that. But anyway, um, deal with it. Number one. Yeah, that uh, Ezekiel is good. That is a pretty good one. I know a lot of fathers saw the um, the parallelism there in Ezekiel. That's a good one to use. Some fathers notice that. At the end of the day, I really, really prefer. Noting the parallelism that we find in Judges 11 and Luke 1, particularly because of the Greek words that are being utilized there and the fact that the early fathers noted that as well. That is a good one. The one on arise thy Lord and thy ark of thy might, I believe is how it goes, is a really good one. That was utilized by many fathers that wrote the Dormition and the Assumption homilies. One of them in particular was John of Damascus who utilizes that very one and says the church used that to teach the assumption. All right. This one, I know what, uh, Trendy. Trendy, you got some good questions, man. I don't know about your picture, though. You know what they're referring to. In the Latin Vulgate, it says, yeah. she will crush that of the serpent. That's a mistranslation, William. Come on, man. Yeah, so um, here's the, that is a good one. Trendy, thank you very much. Number one, uh, you know, the dogma of Genesis 3 does not rely upon any kind of mistranslation. We read the text as the Messiah is the one that crushed the head of the serpent. Now, at the end of the day, can we say that Mary played a role in that as well? You, if you want to do that, fine. I, I would. I can agree in a sense, but we don't rely upon a mistranslation. We don't rely upon a Latin text. We rely upon the actual oldest text. We recognize that the oldest manuscripts say the Messiah crushed the head. But what is the most important is Genesis 3.15 says there will be enmity between the woman and her seed, meaning the Messiah, meaning as the fathers viewed it, that the mother of the Messiah and the Messiah would be at complete enmity, would never be in under the dominion of Satan. That is why we view the serpent chasing our lady in the book of Revelation. So even if we translate that, whatever we would translate it, the heart of the dogma is found in that, that Mary is at complete enmity with sin, with Satan. And brother, do you want me to give you now some biblical support that Mary is involved, the Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus, is involved Amen. in crushing the head of the serpent? You guys ready? Amen. Amen. Okay, I want you guys listen now. I'm now going to give you biblical support that the Blessed Mother of our Lord Jesus is included in crushing the head of the serpent. You guys ready? I'm excited because... I thank the Lord that he's given me the grace to allow whatever is true to be true and accepted. Here you go. Romans 16, verse 20. This is the promise of Genesis 3.15. I got several passages. Pay attention now how this is going to include the Blessed Mother. So if you're going to affirm Sola Scriptura, you can't object to this. If you're going to affirm 
Sola Scriptura, because I came to embrace these things because of Sola Scriptura. The Lord knows I'm not lying. Romans 16, verse 20. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. Hold on. Satan's being crushed under the feet of the church, the believers. Last time I checked, Mary's part of the church. And if you believe she's the mother of the Lord, and he's that of the church, and she's the mother of the church. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So notice, Jesus is going to use the feet of his spiritual body, the church, to crush the Satan under their feet. Well, that definitely must include the Blessed Mother, unless you believe she's not part of the church. That's the first one. Luke 10, 17 to 20. The second one. You guys ready? Luke 10, 17 to 20. You guys ready? Luke 10, 17 to 20. The 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us through your name. The Lord now speaking to the body of believers. And I'm going to show you that Mary, our, uh, our mother, the mother of our Lord, is included. He said to them, I saw Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Look, I give you, all of you who believe in me, who follow me. And Judas was there, by the way. So as long as Judas was faithful, this included him, but he fell away. I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Number one, the Lord is not talking about actual physical scorpions because even atheists can trample scorpions and snakes. Scorpions and snakes here mean demons, evil spirits. I've given you who believe in me, who follow me, power to trample. Well, you're going to trample under your feet. I'm the one giving you power to use your feet to crush demons. And over, over the power of the enemy. And nothing shall be by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice that the spirits are subject to you. Well, hold on. Doesn't that mean they're also subject to Mary, the blessed mother of our Lord, who's part of the church? Of course. But rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Acts 1, verses 8 to 14. Final one. Acts 1, verses 8 to 14. Acts 1, verses 8 to 14. I want to include 8 to see the promise of our Lord includes his blessed mother but you shall receive power who you 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 here about to see me ascend physically bodily into heavenly glory you shall receive power when the holy spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in jerusalem and all judea and samaria and to the ends of the earth when he had spoken these things while they looked he was taken up and a cloud received them from their sight received them from their sight while they looked intently Toward heaven as he ascended, suddenly two men stood by them in white garments. They said, men of Galilee, why stand looking toward heaven? Well, believe me, if you and I saw a physical body ascend physically, we're not going to be saying, oh, okay, hey, guys, let's go have lunch. We're going to be like. And so the angel saying, why are you guys gazing intently into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you to heaven will come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. So now watch this, guys. This is now they return after Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you to empower you to be my witnesses. Who is there to hear this promise? And who is there who will be a recipient of the promise? Verses 12 to 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is a Sabbath day's walk from Jerusalem. When they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Now who was there who heard the Lord Jesus promise them that the Holy Spirit come to empower all of them, who was included? Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James. Notice 14. These all continue with one accord in prayer and supplication with the woman and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. There you go. The Lord Jesus said... That his spiritual body, the church, will receive the power of the Holy Spirit to crush and trample Satan and demons under their feet. A promise that includes Mary. There you go, guys. The biblical basis to show that it is not incorrect to say that the woman, Mary, the mother of our Lord, is included in crushing the serpent under her feet. Amen, brother. That was incredible. I, I knew right what you were building up to when I looked at verse 14. You are indeed correct right there with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus. That is incredible. Right. So, brother, how, how are they going to argue when Romans 16, 20 is talking to the church at Rome? So this promise to the church must apply to the church universally. Universally, 
God will crush Satan under your feet, church. Or Luke 10, 17 to 20. I have given you all who belong to me, who are believers united to me. And that definitely includes the mother of our Lord. I've given you the authority to trample scorpions and snakes. End of story. There you go. Amen, brother. That's incredible. Any other questions, guys? We'll take a few more and wrap it up because it's it's late here. Let me see. Uh, do I see anyone? Oh, okay. This one, maybe you know. I have no idea. The rosary, as prayed today, what is its historical roots? How old is it? How far back does it go? Do, I mean, if that's you want to do a session, we can. Or if you want to answer briefly, it's up to you, brother. Uh, how about we do a session, brother? Because I have got a ton of... That I've okay. written on that. I think it would be very valuable for the audience where we can look at it throughout early church history. I think that would be very good. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Someone's asking, is that you asking me? Uh, the Macklin conception? Yes. I do believe that our Lord preserved his mother without the stain of sin. Amen. Now, understand though, and you can comment on this. Even the Eastern Orthodox Church believes that Mary is Panagia, all holy, so yep. pure. But because of their understanding of original sin, they may not call it Macklin Kimson. Can you comment on that just so people understand? Yeah, you, you, you're definitely correct there, brother. Um, whereas within Eastern Orthodoxy, it's not a dogma. You find a number of their theologians that indeed do believe that. For people that are also wondering, I'm going to be hosting a panel. And so for people saying, oh, no, I'm Eastern Orthodox. You know, we don't teach that. Or for some uh, Oriental that say, oh, well, we're Oriental and, uh, you know, uh, we don't believe that. A lot of Oriental Orthodox do believe that. And a lot of Eastern Orthodox do. And I'm going to be hosting a panel with, with uh, an Eastern Orthodox scholar and with Father Coppes, where they're going to even be talking about the Marian dogmas and how Eastern Orthodoxy and Catholicism are on the same page in regards to those. Yeah, here you go. Mango, bango. I'm an Orthodox catechumen, and I believe in the Immaculate Conception. There you go. So yep. Athena is asking me. I just answered that. Uh, when you say sinless, she's sinless by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, because I know there's Amen. a lot of straw men out there. I will believe and accept anything that's ancient and that does not contradict Scripture. And I've seen evidence that's persuaded me the belief in Mary's purity, that the Lord was pleased to keep her pure from her womb, so that her body would be purified to then give to Jesus his flesh and bones. Yep. You even find one of our Assyrian, for the Assyrians, I don't know if you know this, Ephraim the Syrian, Ephraim Suraya. He just mentioned an Assyrian. Oh, yeah. Another one. Ephraim was Assyrian, Ashuraya. He was one of us. He was our physical ancestor and spiritual ancestor. Read his hymns where he exalts the Blessed Mother and praises her her purity, her immaculate purity. And he's a Syrian, Ephraim the Syrian. Brother, maybe you want to comment on that real quick. You, you know what I, I need to do, brother? I need to email you. The brother Elijah, by the way. Oh, man, Elijah's incredible. He'll be an Assyrian brother. Yeah, you know what he he what he did? And it'll, it'll be great for your audience. Everybody has heard of the very famous Nisabine hymn, 27, I believe, where Ephraim is talking about the sinlessness of Mary, but you only find a little piece of it oh, translated. Gave it to you right here, brother. He did right here. Oh, there we go. It, it is 27. Oh, I got it right. Thank the good Lord. I was right. Yeah, praise Pe the Pe People only hear of that little piece. Well, I'm going to blow you away, brother, and I'm going to send that to you tonight. The brother Elijah has translated the whole chapter. Yeah, I'll post it. They send the it to me. Guys. It is nowhere else, anywhere in English. Nowhere else. He went through the trouble of translating all of it. I'm going to get it to you tonight, brother. Uh, guys, I promise you I'll post it. But uh, Assyrians, Assyrian Chaldeans, pay attention. I want you to rejoice in our Lord Jesus that God has raised among our own people warriors of the faith. Assyrian Chaldeans, pay attention. Prophet Google. Saint Ephraim Aturai Ashurai. He's one of us. Notice what he's writing around 370 AD. 370 AD. And how do we know this is an ancient belief? Because when you find a church father saying something where he doesn't have to defend it or explain it, that means it's common knowledge. Yep. In other words, when I say to people, praise Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is God, I'm assuming the people already believe this. I don't have to defend it. I don't have to explain it. So now notice St. Ephraim unapologetically, 
doesn't have to defend it, doesn't actually, because he believes this is common knowledge to the Christians of the time. So that means this statement must be earlier, believed on earlier before he wrote it. Notice what he says about the mother of our Lord, Assyrian Chaldeans, one of us who is now glorified in the presence of Jesus. Amen. Thou alone and thy mother, thou alone and thy mother are in all things fair. There is no flaw in thee and no stain in thy mother. And he's going to give me now what one of our Chaldean brothers translated from Ephraim. And I promise you I'll post it tonight, Lord Jesus willing. Amen, now, bro. let me just uh, uh, address some misunderstandings because we have Protestants. Saying, what do you mean sinless? Only Jesus is sinless. No one believes that Mary in of herself is sinless. She's a creature who needs Jesus to save her. And Jesus, in his love for his mother, saved her from contracting sin to keep her pure for him. So without Jesus, she could not be sinless. Without Jesus, she could not exist. Without Jesus, she would have no life. So yep. it's because of Jesus that she is what she is, because of Jesus saving her and loving her and preserving her to be his mother. It's Amen. because of Jesus. She's not sinless independently of Jesus, but because of her son, the Lord Jesus, who loves and adores her. So I just want to be clear. Amen, brother. That is all fantastic. That's, I mean, and, and, and one point that I want to add for people, that Nisabine hymn, I have gone very, very, very deep into it. I've talked to Dr. Brock, who, by the way, is the top Syriac apologist in the world. And we have looked at the fact that Ephraim, in other areas where he uses the very same word, he applies it to people that have original sin. So he's directly telling you right there, Mary has no sin. Yeah, Mario Garcia, your question is not related to the topic, brother. When I open up, when I do an open Skype Q&A, then you can ask me. So far, let me see if I can find one more question. We're going to go tonight. Now, let me repeat again. You have my permission. Take these sessions, the articles that we link to. Upload them to your channels, to your sites. Make clips out of them. Translate them. You don't need to ask me. And Lord willing, I'm going to bring the brother back in about two weeks because I'll be back in one town. We'll do a session on the rosary and other topics by the grace and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, let me see if there's one more question. If not, we're calling it a night, man. Uh, let me see. Our, uh, I, I think you answered this, right? Okay, we'll take this. Did Sister sister Mary? <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I did. But uh, let me tell him right again. Um, we don't, nobody believes that Mary ascended because ascension is what Christ did. We believe that Christ bodily assumed Mary into heaven because the early church all taught that and we have clear allusions to that in the Bible of Mary referred to as the ark and referred to in the book of Revelation in the heavens in bodily form. Okay, now, uh, Brother Ryan, let me help you rest at ease that you can call Mary your mother, okay? I know you're trying to be biblical and I respect that because when I wanted to be biblical, if there was something that I thought was contrary to scripture, I would fear to affirm it. But Ryan, I'm going to now speak to you heart to heart because you are a regular. I know you love Jesus Christ. You love the Bible and you're not one of those here to attack. Ryan is not one of those who, to attack. So guys, be careful because I know some of you are trigger happy. You like to block people. Uh, Ryan, let me show you from the Bible that you should not hesitate to call Mary your mother. Let me explain why. Let me show you from the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mark 3, 3 31 to 35. Mark 3, 31 to 35, specifically verse 35. Now, brother, let me say, you guys may think I'm lying when I say this. It's the Bible. The Holy Spirit used the Bible. The Holy Spirit used his perfect word, the Bible, to bring me to accept these things. Amen. And I'll, I'll chronicle my journey again in the future. I have mentioned it, but I'll do a session. Why did Sam Shimon become a heretic and embrace the Catholic Church and go back to the Church of the East? Why is he a heretic and ecumenist used by the Masons and the Illuminati to bring about a one world government? <laughs> I'm just kidding, by the way. <laughs> okay, Ryan, I need you to listen. Mark 3, 31, 35. Honest to God, if something, if it could not be shown to me from the Bible, I would not accept it. It's because of the Bible that I've come to embrace these things. It's Amen. because of the Bible. Honest, the Lord knows if I'm lying, I'll answer to the Lord and he'll rebuke me. The Lord knows if I could not be persuaded from Scripture, I will not accept it. And now I accept these things because now the Holy Spirit I trust 
He's guiding me, illuminating me to understand the relationship with the Bible and church tradition. Now, let me read this to you, Ryan, and we're going to end it with this. We'll end it with a prayer, and let me read this to you. Mark 3, 31, 35, from the words of our Lord, then his mother and his brothers came and standing outside. His mother and his brothers came standing outside. They sent to him calling him. The crowd sat around him and said to him, your mother and your brothers are outside asking for you. He answered, who are my mother and my brothers? Now pay attention, Ryan. Please pay attention. Okay. 34 and 35, specifically verse 35. Then he looked around at those who sat around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Forever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Now notice the beauty of our Lord Jesus' words because he's God and he speaks perfectly. Notice what's missing from that group. He doesn't say, and is my father. You can be Jesus' sister. You can be Jesus' brother. You can be Jesus' mother, but you cannot be his father because only one is his father, God in heaven. Did you catch it? Amen. His mother and brothers are outside, but he also includes women who can be his sisters. Mother and brothers are outside. Well, whoever does the will of God, you can be my brother and mother. You can even be my sister, but I only have one who's my father, God in heaven. So now, Ryan, Jesus says someone who does God's will, who is an elderly woman, she can be his mother. Now, let me ask you a question. You're being biblical, right? If Mary is truly his mother physically and spiritually, she's physically his mother, flesh of her flesh, bone of her bones, and spiritually she is his mother because she did the will of God. Go to Luke 1. Don't take my word for it. And let me let me read it. Hold on. <laughs> let me just read it for you. Because I'm great, great way of laying it out, brother. Yeah, because I want him to be comfortable. Luke 1, 38 to 45. My, my brother, Luke 1, 38, 45. Okay? I'm sorry. I wasn't Mark. Let me get there. Luke 1, 38 to 35. Watch here, brother. Mary says to Gabriel, Mary said, I am the servant of the Lord. I am the servant of the Lord. May it be unto me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. Notice, she goes, I am the Lord's servant. I will do as he says. What did Jesus say? If you do the will of God, you are my mother. Mary's not only his biological mother, but spiritually she's his mother because she bowed her knee to the will of the Lord. Now watch this, Ryan. Scripture, huh? Scripture. In those days, Mary arose, Luke 1, 38 to 45. In those days, Mary arose and quickly went into the hill country to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard, heard the greeting of Mary... The baby, John the Baptist, was six months old in her womb. Leaped in her womb. Now watch, Ryan. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit filling her and John in the womb. She spoke out with a loud voice. Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Here's one part of the rosary. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. Blessed are you among women. Blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me? That the mother of my Lord should come to me. I am unworthy. Notice what she's saying. Holy Spirit filling her to say this, Ryan. I am unworthy that the mother of my Lord should come into my home. Now watch this. Indeed, as soon as the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. A six-month-old baby in the womb. An unborn baby, six months old in the womb. When he heard the voice of Mary, leapt because the Holy Spirit helped him realize that's the mother of your Lord greeting your mother. And Elizabeth elated, saying, she is the mother of my Lord. And notice verse 45. Blessed is she who believe, for there will be a completion to those things which were told her by the Lord. You continue reading, and Mary says, all generations will call me blessed. So now, Ryan, Mary is the mother of our Lord physically and spiritually because she does the will of God. Elizabeth and her six-month-old unborn child, filled with the Holy Spirit, rejoice at the sound of her voice. Elizabeth calls her the mother of my Lord, saying, you are blessed among women, and you're, the, the fruit of your womb is blessed, and you have believed the words of your Lord. If that's the case, and Jesus, whoever does the will of God is my mother, how much more 
is Mary worthy of being called the mother of the Lord? Not only did she give him his flesh, but she believed and truly is a spiritual mother and physical mother. If so, Ryan, if you're his brother, then his mother has to be your mother. So if you're his brother, why then do you hesitate to call her my mother? Especially when in John 19, 25 to 27, Jesus at the, at the cross says to his mother, woman, behold your son, John. And John, behold your mother. And John then took her into his home as his mother. Why do you call her your sister? Why don't you call her your mother? With that said, Amen. brother... And if you have a final comment, go ahead. If not, brother, well, that it, it, incredible the way you laid that out. Beautiful. My only final comment would be everybody keep an eye out. We will be back together. We'll be doing more shows. But above all, pray for Sam and his travels. Pray for him. Pray for his daughters. Brother, incredible session, brother. Thank you for yeah. your time. Brother, let me rejoice with you in saying, look what Brian said. Yes, makes sense. Thank you, Brother Sam. Did you guys hear Amen. it? Amen. This is a man who loves Jesus. This is a man who's open to the truth. This is a man who yields to the Holy Spirit. Notice what he said. Ryan just said, yes, makes sense. Thank you, Brother Sam. So, guys, pray for William and I. Pray for our families. Pray for our health. If the Lord Jesus tarries to give us many more years, healthy years, to use our health to glorify him, ask the Lord Jesus to bless my daughters, miraculously protect them so I can see them, if he's pleased, before the year is over. June is coming. It'll be two years I haven't seen them or kissed them. But I trust the Lord who loves them. He'll bring them to me. Pray for our holiness to delight the Lord Jesus and pray for provision to do the work of the Lord. He doesn't need me. doesn't need William. We need him. Pray for that. And Lord willing, don't forget, Friday, I will be in Miami. So if you're in Miami, God willing, I'll be there. Come and meet me. I'll be there until Sunday. Friday, I'll get there, God willing, and I'll do a session with William this week. Now let's end it in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, Abba, we love you. Son of God, Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Thank you, Lord, for bringing a blessed crowd. Because of your grace, we have about 360, Lord. May you increase the number for your glory so more people can be blessed by these sessions. Bless my brother William mightily. Fill him with the Holy Spirit. Bless his family. Preserve them. Keep them holy and in love with Jesus. Provide for him to do the ministry. Give him the health and the holiness to delight your heart. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name, all who are gathered, bless them. Those who may not accept these things, show them if we have spoken the truth and confirm that truth in their hearts and save us from error, save us from sin and guide us into all truth to accept the truth, even if it means losing people who up to this point have been partnering with us because it will come at a price there will be christians who think that we've compromised that we become heretics have mercy on them lord have mercy on them and may we never do it for the praise of men may we never do it for money or fame but do it for your glory even if it means losing everything in our lives you are worthy you are worthy father son of god you are worthy and holy spirit you are worthy preserve us into all truth and correct our mistakes and save us from sin and satan and his children and guide us to perfect love of the Son, to love him perfectly and live for him perfectly and even die for him if that is your will, because the Lord Jesus is our life. We thank you, Father. Son of God, we thank you. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Bless our loved ones. Bless my daughters and preserve them in the love of Jesus forever. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Maranatha. Amen. Lord bless you guys. We'll see you sometime this week. Take care. Amen.